Welcome everyone. Um, it's good to know that many of you are familiar with the Fit for Purpose framework. Um, perhaps you've read the book or you've been in some of the training classes. We are planning a third edition of the book and late for later this year, although to be honest, we've been planning it for a couple of years. The pandemic has, and other real life events have gotten away. So what's new in the third edition of the framework what will be new in the third edition of the book and the other big news is that we are launching the third edition of the book when it's ready of course probably later this year uh, simultaneously in english and brazilian portuguese so we're recognizing um, the popularity of the fit for purpose framework in brazil and you'll be able to consume the third edition in uh, in your own language. <clears throat> All right, so okay, it won't let me change the screen. The I can't change the slide. I don't know what's what's wrong here. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and try resharing the screen. It's always when we practice it that it decides to not work. Yeah. Let's try this again. All right, this time it's working. Okay, so many of you will recognize the, the book cover. The second edition, it's actually now uh, almost four years old. And what has changed since then? Well, primarily we've learned from using the framework. And we've learned from, from broader ap applicability. We started out really just using the fit for purpose framework in our own businesses and associated with Kanban systems. And over the last few years, we've seen much broader application of it. So we've, we've learned, uh, we've revealed some blind spots we had before. And the, the focus with this third release, if you're familiar with the poster, you'll notice that the left-hand side of the poster is a lot busier now. And what we've done is we've enhanced the framework's ability to help you with product management by increasing the number of commonly recurring fitness criteria. The, 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 uh, common reasons that people select one product or service over another and we've enhanced the ability to use the framework for strategic marketing by providing an operating system a, a process framework to go along with the decision framework uh, that has existed since the, the first release so we're going to take a look at the new fitness criteria. You see the I zoom in on the poster here, the left-hand side of the poster, there are now six criteria altogether, time, convenience, affordability, quality, safety, and conformance, and, and optionality. And um, we'll, we'll take a look at them. Commonly recurring fitness criteria help us anticipate features um, and implementation elements of service delivery or customer experience that customers expect or will value. So in other words, rather than just make your best guess, throw something into the market and collect feedback and be reactive to that, we can be a lot more anticipatory. We know that people care about time. If they order, say, a sofa for the living room, when will it be delivered? We care about time. We care about quality. <clears throat> we care about convenience. We don't want to <clears throat> waste a lot of our time traveling around looking for a solution or spending huge amounts of time searching on the internet. So we value convenience. We value making it easy and, and so forth, right? We know these things in advance. Therefore, 
if you make a change to a product or service that makes those things better, faster, easier, people will like it. We know this in advance. We don't need to survey them after the fact. And using the, the fit for purpose framework helps us to do this, it helps us to be anticipatory. And that means we move faster, we move with less cost, and we're more likely to hit the market. We have a better empathy for the market we're targeting uh, in advance. So the first edition, first and second editions of the framework, they cover time, quality, safety, and conformance. These are very typical fitness criteria for the type of work that's flowing through a Kanban board. When will it be ready? How long will it take? Will it hit the fixed delivery date requirement? Will it be of sufficient quality? And are we meeting safety and conformance criteria that are essential for the market? <clears throat> However, these other three, affordability, convenience, and optionality, turn out to be very effect, very important in more general consumer marketing situations. And uh, we're going to take a look at these uh, individually. So first of all, affordability. Value, price, and affordability are not the same thing. The Agile community loves to talk a lot about the value of something. Well, it's often in the eyes of the beholder and quite difficult to define. The price of something is a separate issue from its value because something could be more valuable to you than the price you have to pay for it. Or it could be less valuable, um, but the, the, you, know, you, you pay more although perhaps more likely the first situation, you value something for some emotional connection. It's worth much more to you than you could sell it for. Um, but these things are not the same as affordability. Affordability relates to things like your income, your cash flow, how much you can afford to pay on a weekly or a monthly basis, um, whether you can finance something with a bank loan, whether you can lease something that in some parts of the world that's known as higher purchase where you're leasing it but you own it in the end whether you rent something or whether it's a service with a monthly or an annual plan so you'll recognize from the, the car industry that you can buy your car you can lease it you can long-term rent it um, and if you don't do, do those things nowadays, you can have an app that helps you find cars parked in the local uh, area where you can rent them by the hour, just pay with the app. So the, the automotive industry has been finding ways of making driving a car more affordable, and that makes a much broader audience for what they're doing. Right. So uh, affordability, we can break it into owning and renting, purchasing. Do we have the financial means? Do we have enough money? What's the elasticity there? Like if the price is too high, then we just can't afford it. So we don't buy it at all. And if that was the only way of acquiring an item like a car, you either have one because you're rich or you don't have one. Then financing which is availability of credit, liquidity in the market. Is there a bank willing to lend you the money and over what period, at, at how much per month? And there might be tax incentives, rebates, for example, with electric cars over the last 10 to 15 years, governments have been encouraging electric car adoption by offering a, a discount, a rebate, on the purchase price of the car, a tax incentive. Um, then with, uh, with renting, there could be lease. It, it usually involves some kind of down payment, there's still some equity to put in there. Then there's a monthly, monthly cost, and there might be a, a payment at the end so that you take ownership at the end of the lease. 
or it could be subscription. Um, it's just a cost and a period. And then there could be shared usage, the type of thing where you have an app and it tells you where there's a car parked locally and you can open it with the app and drive away. You only pay for the hours that you use. So the same thing happens with scooters and bicycles and, and so forth. All right, so affordability boosts the value of something and it, it expands the market. If you can make things more affordable, you open up new market segments and you, you make something more valuable because it's within the means of the person to acquire it. Uh, I think that that covers all three bullet points there. Providing more affordable means of payment enables market segments that would otherwise be locked out. So you can expand a market through affordability. And th this should send a message to a lot of product managers. It might not be features you need to add to your product in order to make the market bigger, in order to sell more. You might just need to enable a different way of paying for it. Moving on to convenience. Um, in general, we love convenience. It's really, really addictive. In fact, it should probably be regulated because some things that are just too convenient um, tend to distract us and we spend too much time and money on them. So in general, consumers always love more convenience. And we should think about three basic forms of convenience, geographical, temporal, and communication. Right. And in, as a general rule, if we improve convenience, it's focusing on making it easier to do business with us, make it easier to find us, easier to buy from us. Um, the consumer spends less energy to do business with us than they would have to spend to do business with someone else. So geographical convenience, local locations, proximity, time uh, with this kind of online thing, the time zone can matter, the language can matter. So supporting uh, local convenience I noticed yesterday that the the BBC's news website has started showing me adverts for the new Lotus sports car. Now, while the Lotus sports car might be a very attractive uh, vehicle for someone to own if they if they have enough time and money to to have a, a sports car, not very convenient for doing the groceries, perhaps, or commuting to work or taking your children to school or going on vacation. But if you're in the market for a sports car, a Lotus might be a very nice one to have. But where the heck do you buy one? Where is the local Lotus dealer? How far away is it? It could be hundreds of kilometers away from where you live. And if you need to get the oil changed or the car serviced later, it's not very convenient. So it, it's a specialist market buying, buying uh, a, a Lotus sports car. On the other hand, in the last couple of years, I've been considering, should I buy an electric car? And of course, it's very trendy for people to have Teslas. I have no idea where you buy a Tesla. There are lots of them in the city uh, around me. If I went out for a walk here, within five minutes, I would see many Teslas. I have no idea where you buy one, but I know that from, from one of our other offices, I can walk five minutes to the local Volkswagen dealer and I could buy one of their electric cars. So an existing manufacturer like Volkswagen has an advantage. They have a lot of local locations. They have convenience, they have proximity. Temporal convenience, the idea that you're open all hours or seven days a week or 365 days a year. So the whole concept and the, the term in American English of a convenience store quite literally means that they're open a lot and that they're located in your local neighborhood. So they have 
geographical convenience and temporal convenience. And this is what makes them convenience stores. If you can make your business more convenient, then uh, you'll do better. And historically, there have been analysis of, for example, drug stores, pharmacies here in the United States um, who pursued different strategies. And Walgreens has been incredibly successful as a pharmacy and a drug store. And their strategy was to have more stores conveniently located, usually at intersections, big traffic lights. And on one, one of the four corners, there would be a Walgreens. And there would be one of those within just two or three minutes drive of wherever you lived. And one of their competitors chose to have fewer, bigger stores that were further away from people. And those big stores were, in theory, very efficient to operate. But people didn't like it because it wasn't so convenient. So instead, they went to Walgreens more often, and Walgreens won that battle. And there are many more business examples like that over the years of focusing on make it convenient for your customer, don't focus on efficiency and economy of scale. Then we have communication convenience, right? So these could be linked to geographical and temporal convenience if, you've, if you're moving online, your website or your mobile app are always available anywhere. Uh, what are the opening hours for your call center, your telephone service? Do you have text and live chat on your website? And is it available in a preferred customer language where, where that might be economically viable? Or in some cases, it might be, might be regulated. Some countries protect their original language. Uh, our office in Bilbao in Spain is part of the Basque country, and the Basque language is protected. So local banks, for example, need to provide their banking service in the Basque language. Uh, part three, or one uh, part point three, optionality. So consumers value optionality when their purpose might change or they already anticipate having multiple purposes for a given product or service. Therefore, they need adaptability for different uses at specific times. Again, if you think about buying a car, it's a very obvious way of, of recognizing that on different days of the week or different times of day, you need the car for a different purpose. Sometimes you're driving to work, other times you're picking the kids from school and taking them to a soccer game. And occasionally, sometimes of the year, you're going on vacation, making a long road trip. And if you want a single vehicle that serves all those purposes, you need one that's adaptable and can be reconfigured. Generally, with more expensive, bigger investments, longer life expectancy of the product, the more adaptable it needs to be. If you're a young couple, you're freshly married, you're buying your first house and a new car, maybe you're going to have a baby. And do you need to buy another car when the baby comes? Or would you like the existing car to be suitable when you have a baby in the future? Then. The service equivalent of that is service plans that can be easily switched or changed as consumer circumstances change. One example would be uh, mobile phone plans. It's very common for mobile phone operators to offer family plans where the one household has the one plan and you have four or five different devices uh, and everyone in the family uses it. Well, perhaps those kids grow up, they go to college, they get jobs, they become adults, they, they do their own thing. You don't need uh, the, the same family plan. Or again, vice versa, you don't have any kids yet or the kids are too small to have phones. But as they grow up, your needs change. The same would be true for your cable TV, your internet service and, and those sorts of things. Don't lock consumers into something that they may not need in the future, that will put them off buying, provide them with simple options to switch. So when, when we're consuming a product or service for more than one purpose, we will value reconfigurability. So if you're 
consumers are telling you that they come to you for multiple purposes or they want your product or service to fulfill multiple purposes, your product or service has to be reconfigurable. They're not going to buy three. They want one thing that serves three purposes. Choice or the ability to customize our product or service has an important relationship to identity, mood, and personality. So the more developed a market, the, the, the less people buy something for a specific functional reason, and the more they buy it because it's who they are. It shows off their personality, their identity, or they want to adapt it to how they're feeling today. What's the weather like? How am I dressed? Um, what mood am I in? And something that's very adaptable will be appealing to, to that type of person, particularly in a mature market where all of the products in the market probably fulfill the functional needs. And now we're looking at, in addition to functional needs, what are the emotional needs of the buyer? And when the future is uncertain or we're unsure of our needs, then postponement, deferred commitment is useful. Is our product or service adaptable? Can we buy extra bits for it later on? Can we put a roof rack and a ski box on the, on the car? Can we add a towing hitch? Can we buy a trailer to, or a camper or something to tow behind the car uh, when we go on vacation? Is the interior modifiable in some, some ways or, or another? Can we put child seats in there, for example? Maybe not in a Lotus sports car. All right, so, so that covers the extensions we've made to the common fitness criteria. So now we have this set of six, which you see on the left-hand side of the poster. And then spinning off that are all the detail that uh, I've outlined. And if you look at that as a map, you should be able to look at your product or service design and say, which elements in this design target these things? And which areas have we not covered that we might want to think about? Enables us to be anticipatory and design a better product that's empathetic to a wider set of market segments, a wider audience much faster. <clears throat> now, moving on, uh, how, do we, how do we operate the Fit for Purpose framework? We didn't really cover that in the first two books, the first and second edition. And now we have lots of experience, and I've asked Lauren, who will share with us some of how we use the Fit for Purpose framework at the, the School of Management. But first of all, just a little revision that we survey customers using an F for P card or some similar mechanism that asks people, what was your purpose for doing business with us? And then how well did we fulfill the purpose using our taxonomy of zero through five here? And then the third question of tell us why uh, you gave us the score you did in the second question. And we collect those from, from our customers and we analyze them. So we might, in this example, we've analyzed uh, four segments, why people came to a training class. And there were pragmatic managers, there were people, managers looking for solutions to problems they have. Professional development, people who are trying to enhance their career, then people who just want the certification. And then there might be office politics. You know, my boss sent me to the class. And then we can assess based on those purposes, how well people like us. And what we see here is that um, there are two of the segments where we have a very strong response, positive response. And we have one segment where there's really quite a, a disappointing response. And that enables us to make assessments like, is this a, a segment we want and we should try to grow it and target it, amplify it? 
Is it a segment that we don't really want, but we don't mind if they come and, and those customers come and, and spend their money, uh, but we're not going to over-serve that segment. And then there are people who are disappointed, people that we weren't targeting, who came to us thinking they were buying something else and then they were disappointed and now they're going to talk badly of us and we don't want that to happen. We'd rather those people didn't come at all. So we want to switch them off. In this example, the office politics segment, we want to switch it off. The certification segment, we're like, yeah, we'll take their money. And the pragmatic managers with problems to solve in the office, we want more of them. How do we find more people? How do we grow that segment? And we do that with, um, unfortunately, this blue pop. Let's get rid of this. Oh, it's one big graphic. Oh, that's really annoying. Okay, so I apologize. But this should have been a pop-up. All right, so we have a, a, a two by three matrix. And the market segments are either segments we want to target. And a market segment, of course, is defined by the customer's purpose. We either want to target those purposes or we don't want to target the purposes. That gives us two rows. And then we're either doing really well, that's satisfactory, or we're sort of mediocre, or it's unsatisfactory. And this analysis, uh, this two by three matrix, which we now refer to as the, the A to Z matrix, um, helps us determine where we should make our investments and our marketing and our strategy and our product management. So, What's new in version three? Well, evolutionary change of products and services requires feedback loops. And the fit for purpose framework is designed to facilitate evolutionary change in products and services. And in addition to that, we need some operating framework. Now, this was a blind spot for us in the first editions because we were only ever doing this in a Kanban environment where we already had Kanban cadences. So we already had feedback loops that we could just introduce the fit for purpose data into existing feedback mechanisms, such as the service delivery review, the operations review, the marketing, uh, strategic marketing review. And we've now realized that for people who aren't familiar with Kanban, we need to make this stuff explicit. All right, so feedback needs to be tar <clears throat> target driven with metrics and our fitness thresholds can be used as a target. Think of it like a thermostat for your heating or your air conditioning. We can use the fitness criteria that we've established for a given customer segment to determine the thresholds of when is something good enough and when is it too good and we're over serving that segment but perhaps the higher level enables a second segment that um, one one observation i had on this very recently mercedes announced that they had um, tested a prototype electric car very recently, where they drove the car 1,100 kilometers on a single charge from a location in Germany to the south of France. And th they still had 15% charge left in the batteries. And this model of car will be introduced within the next three years as part of the EQS range, a smaller version of the existing EQS. And that that range is enabling a new market segment. And that market segment applies to me. One of the reasons I don't particularly care to have an electric car at the moment is because they don't go very far on a single charge. And something I do relatively regularly is drive from Bilbao in Spain to Austria through France and Switzerland. 
And that's a 1700 kilometer journey is roughly 850 kilometers every day. And current electric cars would require me to stop halfway through the day, maybe eat a nice lunch in some French motorway cafe while I'm waiting an hour or two for the car to recharge so that I can get to the hotel for the night. Um, where I can just put some petrol in my existing car and I don't have to wait. So I'd rather continue driving my 17 year old car, putting petrol in it than buy an electric car, which can't get the whole distance. But if Mercedes release an electric car with an 1100 kilometer range that can drive on the, on the freeways from Spain through France, Switzerland to Austria, then I might consider buying one, right? So 1100 kilometer range over serves a lot of people who only need to take their electric car from their house to their office or the grocery store. But it enables a different market segment, the grand tourer market segment, people who drive long distances. Um, health indicators and improvement drivers. Uh, I, what's a healthy range for um, how much we're selling every day, for example, the heartbeat of our company and improvement drivers, they tend to have a target which we know will have an influence on a fitness criteria. Therefore, our feedback mechanism, these represent the thermostat settings that we're trying to hit. And we can analyze how well are we doing versus what's the target. A basic feedback mechanism works like this. We have an input reference, the thermostat setting, the, the fitness criteria, excuse me, the range on the health indicator or the target for the improvement driver. We develop our product or service. We deliver it to consumers, we collect the feedback on that. And then we compare how well are we doing versus, um, versus the target. And the fitness criteria, they represent the thermostat setting. We might be gathered, it's, this is FRP survey analysis, but it could be other metrics. We could be collecting lead time metrics, for example, comparing them to known lead time thresholds for customer segments. In reality, we really need a double feedback loop. We have this inner loop and then we have an outer loop where we take our A to Z analysis, our A to Z matrix analysis, and we look at which segments are working, which ones do we want to amplify, which ones are we neutral on, which ones do we want to switch off. And we're particularly interested in where have we stumbled across a segment that we weren't targeting, but those people love us. And therefore, perhaps we can expand our market. We can target a segment we weren't previously targeting because we're already good at it. Um, so I'll leave this on the screen and I'm going to ask Lauren to tell us a little bit about how we use the, the fit for purpose framework and the, the surveys we use and what we do with the data. Yeah, sure. So we send out surveys at the end of every course and at the end of every webinar. And with that data, um, we're able to do some clustering. So if we yeah, take a before look at- you, Can you talk a little bit about how we get people to fill in the survey? Uh, so right now, all of our surveys are electronic since we've only been doing online classes. Um, so using whatever simplest, uh, you'll see today at the end of the webinar that a, a Zoom survey will pop up. Uh, for our courses, we tend to use Google Forms or anything that people are familiar with um, so anything that we can send a link and send reminders so that uh, people are more likely to, to fill it out. So in essence, Lauren, we, we, we catch people just as they're finishing a training class and we remind them and we make it really easy and convenient. Click here, it's only going to take yeah. you one or two minutes to answer the three questions. Yeah, and please do it now before you you know, forget mm -hmm. and move on with the rest of your life. So we make the, the surveys convenient. 
Yeah, and uh, an ideal experience, um, if we have time left in the class, we love to do it in the class because we start all of our classes by talking about, you know, why people are here. Um, so we remind them of the reasons they gave sort of in the beginning of the class to, to be able to fill out the survey at the end. But it sometimes time doesn't allow for that. Yeah, right. so and then, then, yeah, carry on. You collect the data and what do you do with yes. it? Yes. So with the, all the data from all of our courses, we're able to start seeing some patterns. So um, it's kind of objective, but it, eventually after a few times, you'll start to see the same clusters appear in your, in your data. And so you can cluster these people by purpose type and uh, see the fitness score for the whole cluster. Um, so you can see your different segments, different reasons people came, how happy they are with, with you based on those reasons. And with that information, you can put it in the A to Z matrix and get really good, uh, simple, uh, you know, visual idea of what to do with the different segments that emerge through, through each course or, or through each webinar. I don't know if you want me to give some examples. If you have a convenient example yeah. in your head, then that's um, good. Yeah, a couple of minutes. One that comes to mind uh, with the webinars uh, is we were looking at data and, you know, we would have a more advanced webinar on dependency management or these advanced themes. And, uh, you know, people had a purpose that they were attending these webinars to learn about, you know, Kanban from the beginning. They were completely new. And this webinar was too advanced of information for them. So they weren't, you know, we weren't uh, fit for their purpose because their purpose was uh, to gain an introduction. Um, so I passed that feedback on to the team saying, hey, you know, these people are showing up consistently at advanced webinars. Uh, they're maybe not ready. And that's actually how we created our webinar badges. So now at every webinar you join, you can sort of see the level if it's recommended for beginners, intermediate or, or advanced people. All right, that's a really good example. So it's an example of us trying to turn off people who are coming for the wrong reason and will be disappointed by improving the information and helping them make a better selection decision. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to, to finish off here, the, the Fit for Purpose operating system pulls together all the elements in the existing framework. It's really not new. It's just adapting some things we already had in the Kanban method in terms of feedback loops, making them more generic for the purpose of marketing, product management, strategic marketing decisions. Uh, but people also need advice on how to design their F4P card or their online survey, how to solicit and collect meaningful feedback. We've had to learn how to do that how to get people to fill the forms in as lauren was saying we make it convenient we uh, mention it at the end of class and we give people typically that they still have two or three minutes left before the official end of class and they have time to click sometimes we ask them to do it while we're having a discussion so they're doing it in the background so multitasking right Reviewing your survey data and customer fitness, the service delivery review. It's a, we, we can look at, are we meeting customer expectations? Do we have the right fitness criteria? Are our uh, uh, criteria and thresholds set at the right levels? So we're asking two questions. We're asking, are we reaching the thermostat setting we wanted? And is the thermostat setting set correctly? And do we need to improve our product or service? Is it, and if so, is it a design element? Is it an implementation capability? Or is it a customer experience element that needs to be changed? And hopefully you saw earlier in the webinar, it's not always features. That from a product management perspective, there are many other levers that you can pull to improve satisfaction or expand markets and market segments. Right. Reviewing your survey data for strategic marketing, are we serving the right segments? Do we have the right capabilities to satisfy a segment? And if we don't, then perhaps we should stop targeting it. 
Uh, do we have segments we need to switch off, unhappy, unwanted, or accidental customers? Or have we stumbled on new segments that we should embrace and amplify the pleasant surprise? And therefore, we've learned of a market we didn't know existed, and now we can empathize better with that market. We can serve it better. It's a gift. Uh, don't, don't throw it away. All right. So to learn more about this, Lauren, would you like to tell us about the new self-paced learning? Yeah, of course. So our newest course to join our catalog is the Strategic Marketing and Customer Experience course. And this course is 100% self-paced. So it uses videos and online exercises. Um, you no longer need to connect online at a certain time for this course. You just log in, you get six months access and an exam, and you can become a, a certified um, user of the Fit for Purpose framework. And then, and, and where would I find that, Lauren? So, um, on our website, tja.com, if you go through our training uh, tab, you can see a little self paced section where it, right now it's the only course. Hopefully, we'll have some new ones joining it there soon. All right, so it's a new thing for us that we now have entirely online training. And then tell us a little bit about the blended learning. Yeah, so in comparison, the, the Kanban Product Professional courses are one of our blended learning courses. So that means that you will get access to course materials starting two weeks before the course. Um, this includes recorded lectures, uh, case studies, reading, all these things. And then you connect via Zoom with a, a group and a trainer for one week for both KPP1 and KPP2. And the KPP1 course really focuses a lot on the Fit for Purpose framework. There's a lot of great hands-on exercises in there where you get to apply the framework and uh, you're constantly with the instructor. And this is the new product professional track for people who've gone through the basic KMP training. We now offer uh, three career paths. There's uh, the, the KCP, the Kanban coaching professional. So KMPs who want to be coaches, they, they follow the KCP. Uh, KMPs who want to pursue a, a, a career as a manager and a leader in an in a enterprise, a corporation, they pursue the, the KLP, the Kanban leadership professional path. And then we have the third path for people who are working in an upstream discovery innovation um, product management, strategic marketing type of functions where they do the Kanban product professional, the KPP path, that we've taken the F4P content and we've turned it into a, a career path. The, the fit for purpose training is still available, particularly in the, so the class that's based directly on the book is still available from some trainers and particularly in Brazil, it's still very popular, but KPP is a new alternative way to consume the fit for purpose material in a very specific career oriented way. And with yeah, that, we can move on to questions. Yeah, any questions about the courses too, feel free to email at us at info at DJA and we can help you out with that. So at this time, we'll open up for Q&A. So feel free to drop your questions that you have in the box below and we'll get through. Um, so we have one right now. So David, how can I engage a CXO that considers only quick wins or profit to adopt the fit for purpose framework? Um, so, uh, Someone who wants a, a quick win wants to see instant um, instant profits. You're looking for more customers, or you're looking for um, more valuable customers. Customers that a segment that provides greater greater profits. Um, I, I think that the bottom line is. Are you flying blind or do you actually want to be able to shine some light on the market that you're working in and understand it, understand where 
where the profitable customers are and how you might target more of them and understanding potentially where there might be profitable customers that you're not capturing. And I think you would see results very quickly from doing that, that the, the, the feedback cycle, it's not going to be instant, but it, it could be weeks or two or three months that from our own experience, the, the feedback that Lauren analyzes and if she comes back to us and said, okay, I think there's, <clears throat> there's a segment here. Um, and I'm trying to think of some of the relatively recent examples, Lauren, of, of suggestions you've made or things you've detected from the survey data. And then we, um, we create some, some offer in the market. Well, it might take us three or four months. Can, can you remember some of the examples from recently? Well, the um, last year or two. Yeah, the past year, what comes to mind is the coaching. Ah, okay. yes, right. Mm -hmm. So so one of the things we detected was that people who'd previously come to in-person training, one of the advantages was that they could go sit beside me at lunchtime or uh, one of the other trainers, so they could talk to them during breaks or they could just hang out with the other class attendees in the evening having dinner. And they were missing that opportunity. They were missing the opportunity to ask the specific questions targeting individual problems that they have in their own workplace. So to facilitate that, we started to offer an add-on to our training classes that people could pay a little bit extra and book uh, a half hour or one hour to, or, or multiple hour coaching sessions within some limit because primarily we are a training company, we're not a coaching and consulting company. But that was to emulate this experience from the in-person training that people were missing with the online training. And we were able to see some feedback on that within what three to four months, maybe less. Lauren, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I would do with your. I would have a discussion with them about the, uh, are we flying blind? Do we. Do we know where our customers are, why they're coming, where the profitable customers are or not, and how do we target the right ones? I think you get a very fast payback for that. Next. We don't have any other questions at the moment. I'm not sure if anyone will come in the next minute. Um, so maybe maybe take the moment now, Dave, to talk about when the, the third release is expected or or what the status of the fit for purpose framework is in the next year okay so we've been planning a third edition of the book which with the exception of one chapter the chapter describing the the new operating system um, it, that that's ready so we have one chapter to write hopefully within the next month or two it has of course to be edited we do our professional production so sometime after the the northern hemisphere summer perhaps october of this year we'll have the third edition of the book and as i mentioned at the beginning we plan to launch that third edition in the brazilian portuguese language simultaneously with english and it does look like I'll be in Brazil in October. There'll be the Kanban Brazil conference and there might be another conference that I'm attending. So there's an opportunity to do a small book tour in Brazil to promote the new Portuguese language version. Um, and apart from that, our, our plans for the next year are to continue using it more and to integrate it more with other things that, that we're doing. The fit for purpose practices are already mapped into the Kanban maturity model and available on KMM Plus. And we do have the, 
the intention to create an equivalent of KMM plus F for P plus. Um, and whether we'll get to doing that this year um, remains to be seen. There's a, there's a lot going on in the world. We're just finishing up a pandemic and now there's a war. And there's a lot of uncertainty, economic uncertainty. There's a lot of inflation. I'm sure many of you have noticed food prices and domestic fuel bills and, and so on are, are all going up and companies are deferring expenditure. So it's difficult for us to make commitments at this point this year, but our intention is to have an F for P plus similar to KMM plus to have the fit for purpose framework very integrated into everything else we're doing and have the third edition of the book published. That's the one thing that that's most tangible. So it makes sense to target the beginning of October for the book launch so that we can do a book tour in Brazil to promote the Portuguese language version. Okay, great. Well, thank you, David. Um, if anyone has any questions after the webinar, feel free to email us at info at dj.com or at the support email and we'll get back to you. Yeah, there was a comment about someone who joined late. Um, the webinar recording will be available. So if you missed something at the beginning, you'll be able to watch the recording. Yes, we'll get that out shortly. Okay, so thank you, everyone. All right, thank you very much for joining.